Based on discussions with many of you, it appears that no one has been infected with the virus and we need to keep it that way. Many have asked when we might start meeting together again, and unfortunately, no one has a ready answer to that question. Our governor continues to ban meeting together and the progress of the disease in the Bi-County area remains active. We have tried to look for ways to move forward, but for the near term, we will continue to utilize this venue for worship to our Lord. I want to thank the staff for their work in making this come off so smoothly, Jenny for pulling it all together and keeping us all on the same page, as well as continuing with the ladies' ministry, Cade of developing the song service and assisting with technology that's necessary, and Jeff for his messages both on Sunday morning and for his daily lessons in James. Also, I want to recognize Abel and Madison for their efforts in putting together the children's ministry online lessons and encourage you to use them if you're not doing so. Overall, please take advantage of the material provided and use this time to reach out to others to join in with us. On a side note, we're continuing to distribute food from our pantry on a limited basis to those we know of that are in need. We're not asking that you refill the pantry this time 
as that would require additional exposure to those shopping. We are currently meeting known needs with the stock on hand. We encourage each of you to let us know if you are aware of a need in the body or community. This morning I'd like to read to you from Psalms 9. I'm going to be reading verses 7 through 10 if you'd like to join me. But the Lord sets enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Lord and Father, we come to you in prayer this morning as we continue separated from each other. We thank you for always providing so bountifully to us and that we have means and methods to share and encourage one another, even when apart. We thank you for the health you have blessed us with and pray that each would continue to stay well. Father, we ask your blessings on those that are in the front lines of this battle with the virus, the first responders, doctors, nurses, police, as well as those who make it possible for our lives to continue with the comforts we enjoy. Help us not to forget how blessed we are and for us to be generous in our gifts and support of all those working to benefit us. As we consider your blessings this day in song and scripture, Help us to have minds that are open to your message and to be reminded of your greatness. You have provided a means of salvation for each one of us due to the sacrifice of your son. And we pray that we will always remember that as we live our lives and are ready to share the message of that gift to others as we have opportunity. We ask for your wisdom and strength in facing temptations each day and that your spirit will help us in identifying those temptations and help us to be vigilant for ourselves and for our families. Father, we ask that you would continue to be with us during this time, that we would remain vigilant, that we would be a strength to our family and friends. We ask that you be with our staff as they continue to work to provide us these messages and help keep us connected and together and that we would be taking the time for family and support of others around us. It's in Jesus' name that we come to you this morning. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my holy Thank you. 
Good morning, family. I got to tell you, this this is different for me. Um, I'm longing to see um, your faces. I'm longing to to have a conversation about uh, your past week, um, about your family, about your children, about gardening, about fishing, about godly things. But here's where we are right now. This past week, uh, we took a drive and, and we ended up driving by the building. And it really hit home um, the fact that that I haven't seen my brothers and sisters, that I, I can't pull up and, and, and know by the vehicles who's there and who's not. Um, as I was thinking about this thought, you know, I was, I was a little depressed, I'm not going to lie to you. But then as I start reading through the scriptures, I realize that we are all under the same, um, in, in the same situation. And we are all under the same power and, and majesty of a God that loves us. And as I, as I read through some things, you know, some peace started coming to me. And that peace comes through Jesus Christ. That peace comes through God, who is love. First John chapter 7 excuse me, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God, God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the perpetuation of our sins. So, so as I think about this, as, as I long to see my brothers and sisters, I'm reminded that we are loved. I'm reminded that the, the same moon that we look out in the evenings, my brothers and sisters are looking at. I'm reminded that, that the sun that we see in the morning that rises, my brothers and sisters see that same sun. And I'm reminded this morning, as we think about the bread that we are about to partake of, that was a body that was represented through Jesus Christ. And that was because of the love of God that he had for mankind. He loved us enough that he sent his one and only son. And so, so even though we can't see each other, even though we can't have a conversation with another face to face, we still serve an awesome God, one who loves us. And the focus this morning on the bread, on his body, it's a reminder for me, we are blessed. In lieu of everything that has happened, in lieu of, 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 of whatever transpires with the economy, with um, health, with um, not being able to do things that we would like to do, we are still blessed. And that's because we have the hope of Jesus Christ. Let us remember these things as we partake of the bread. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning that we have. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for all of us partaking of the bread this morning, Father, that represents Jesus' body, that he willingly came to this earth and that he lived a life free of sin and that he willingly went to the cross and, and died for each and every one of us. Let us remember the blessing of the love that you have for all of mankind. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the passage that I had, had just read in, in verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that word propitiation, what, what that means is in, an action meant to regain someone's favor or to make up for something you did wrong, that I did wrong, that we did wrong. And Jesus came and the action was to die on that cross. And that blood that was pure, that was blameless, that had no malice, no sin in it, was shed for each and every one of us. 
but but thanks to our our wonderful and 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 magnificent God, Jesus conquered death and He rose again on that third day. And this morning, as we partake of this this fruit, um, which represents the blood of Jesus, let's think about that. Let's think again about the love of God that He has for us, no matter where we are, no matter our situation. The love of God is there for us, for all of us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember the blood of Jesus, to remember the sacrifice of a, of a king, Father, who had no sin in his body, on his mind, in his thoughts. Was, he was pure and, and holy, Father, and he died for each and every one of us. Thank you for this memory that we have, and may we cling to it, and may it uh, give us peace during these uncertain times. A blessing on each and every one of us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last Supper, uh, John had breakfast with Jesus after the resurrection. 
had seen Jesus ascend back into heaven to where Jesus' name would be the name above all others. But at this point in John's life, he finds himself alone on a deserted island called Patmos. His body had betrayed him with age. Everybody was hoping that John would just kind of fade away, that his best years were behind him, and there was really nothing left in the ministry of the great apostle. Until he had a vision. An unexpected vision that so alarmed John that he fell down on the ground as though he were a dead man. I think that's probably how we would have responded as well. But it's such a precious thing what Jesus does. Jesus puts his hand on John and he encourages him. Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And this is found in Revelation chapter 1, 17 through 18. Now Jesus turns his attention to the first church of these seven churches of Asia that he speaks about in the very first part of the book uh, of Revelation. He turns to this Ephesian church that were singled out because of their blessedness. They had been, uh, uh, the church had been started by the Apostle Paul, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 19. It, it was a great church. It was a marvelous church. It was an outpost for outreach in all of the region. So many good things. Now, let's look at our passage for today. It's found in Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. And that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And if you do not repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The Ephesian church was a model in so many ways for other churches. It is the dwelling place of, of the Apostle Paul. Uh, the relationship that Paul had with the Ephesian elders was tender and warm. He enjoyed their blessing and he was a blessing to that church also. I want you to notice, though, at the very beginning of our passages, it says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, these lampstands are referring to the church, to these churches that he's going to address. We know that because he, he threatens to take their lampstand from them if they don't change. And that's, in fact, what he does with the Ephesian church. But, but I'm encouraged by this notion that the resurrected Christ still had dealings with these early churches and still cared about them very, very deeply as he does, as he does with us. The church, is, uh, Jesus is still about the practice of being among his people, loving on and directing the fellowship of the arm of God on earth today. 
And that there's a lot of comfort in that. Reminds me of, of God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. That kind of intimacy, that kind of relationship. So everything seems to be going so well. There is such a marvelous report that God through Christ is giving to the Ephesian church until this particular phrase, which becomes the pivot point of this entire portion of scripture. Jesus says, if you do not repent, I'll come to you and I'll take my lampstand from you. Why? What could possibly be so severe? What kind of gross immorality did he find among the Ephesian church? What had they done so wrong? I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now, there's good and bad in all churches. Uh, all churches have their strengths and have their weaknesses. You might look at that and say, well, you know, that's okay. It's okay. You know, we were good in this area, but we didn't do so good in, in this area. But you can't apply that to this. This is way deeper than this. Because of all the good things that they did, the Ephesian church, you can't get past leaving your first love. And Jesus made that very apparent. He said, you know, unless you repent, I'm going to take that lampstand from you. You'll no longer be my people. You're no, you'll no longer be my church. So what does this mean? This losing of your first love. Let's say a couple goes in to a marriage counselor for a tune-up. Um, they feel things are going well. They just want to have an opportunity to kind of get an assessment from a third person to come in and kind of look at how things are going. And so the counselor meets with them individually, and then he meets with them as a couple, and then he even meets with their kids. He calls this couple back into his office to kind of give them a report of his findings. They come back into his, his uh, office and they sit down and they make themselves com uh, comfortable. And he says, you know what? Congratulations. Congratulations. Because I've noticed some really marvelous things about you too. You just love to spend time with each other. You seem to truly enjoy your time together. And I'll tell you, when I talk to your kids, they love you and they respect you. Kids are growing up strong and true and straight. I think anybody would be proud of these kids. Good for you. I even looked into your finances and you seem to be uh, keeping a hold of, uh, of, of wise spending. You're not too far into debt. Good for you. And the church where you attend, you seem to be deeply committed to this church. And even that is growing. Good for you. Good for you. But the thing is, I haven't seen any affection between the two of you. By any criteria I would use for a couple, I found no evidence that you love each other. None whatsoever. In fact, from what you have shown me, I wonder if you ever loved each other. So this couple, they said, well, you know, there's good and bad. You know, we got our money in the bank. Kids seem to be doing okay. But we don't love each other. Would you be satisfied with that outcome? Would you look at that and you'd say, well, you know, 50% is not bad. You know, I, I feel like we're, we're, we're doing pretty good. Or would you look at that last point and say, that's a deal breaker. Everything's got to stop 
so that we can address that. I don't think anybody would be happy with that report. And so as he looks at the Ephesian church in the second chapter of, of the book of Revelation, he notices that they are a serving church, that they're full of energy. Uh, you know, uh, th there was a time when churches would bring in consultants to kind of give a spiritual health report on churches. What if uh, the Richland Church decided that we would hire somebody to come in and evaluate leadership and evaluate ministries and kind of give us an update, a tune-up, if you will, on, on how we're doing? And let's say his report came back and he said, well, you know what I've noticed? I've noticed that 80% of your membership are actively involved in ministry. I, I've also noticed that 90% of those who were involved in ministry last year have signed up to be in ministry again this year. Good for you. Good for you. You're active. You're engaged. People seem happy. Everybody seems content. I didn't hear a lot of division or griping. It was, it was a wonderful thing. This is the report that they're getting from Jesus himself on the Ephesian church. He says, I've noticed that you're a discerning church marked by sound doctrine. He says in verse two, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. And then he also says, you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not and have found them to be false. There's a sense of maturity, depth, discernment. He also, can, uh, uh, he, he also uh, commends them on their perseverance and their stability. He says, you have persevered in the third verse, you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. It's a pretty great report. But then in verse four, understand that this verse is the linchpin in this entire assessment of the Ephesian church. This, this is the pivot point where everything changes from the initial report to the glaring issue. He says this, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now, over the years, uh, I've heard a lot of people preach and write and talk about what this first love was. And it usually boils down into three major categories. The first one is um, you are no longer a loving church. Uh, you lost your first love because you don't seem to love each other. This fellowship love, this brotherly love seems to be absent among you. You've lost it and it is your first love. I just don't think that's it at all. I don't think that's what's being talked about by our Lord. And the reason for that is the first love is described very clearly in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 through 31. The most important command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting, we're told what our first love is. It's not our friendliness toward each other, although that's the natural outcome of a church that is committed in the same direction. Our first love, according to this, is found in that great commandment passage. Our first love is to love the Lord. Secondly, some people have said, well, when he talks about first love, he's really talking about your earliest love. And in fact, some believe that this is sustained later on in the verse, where he talks to them about do the things you did at first, which by the way, I think is great marital advice. Do the things you did at, at first. Um, in a healthy marriage, love deepens over time. It, it matures. 
Uh, the earliest love is not usually the greatest love. I was all enthusiasm as a young Christian, but I didn't have any knowledge. I didn't have any training. I hadn't been through hard knocks. I hadn't had to repent. I hadn't had to overcome. None of those things happened. And in those 40 something years since that time, my love has grown deeper for the Lord. I don't want to go back 20 years. I think where I am with the Lord now is better than it was 20 years ago. Um, then I've heard that what is being talked about is forsaking Christ himself. Forsaking, forsaking Christ himself. And, 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 and I think that this is, in fact, what is being spoken of, even though it sounds so dramatic, so absolutely hard hitting. It is as though Jesus is saying, you're no longer a church of Christ. Now, understand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about the name Church of Christ. I'm not talking about that listing that you have in a church directory of churches in the state of Washington. I'm not talking about it at all. I'm talking about the most primitive understanding of being a church of, of Christ as merely believers, merely a collection of saints actively involved in reaching the lost, comforting the poor, comforting each other, growing families and children, centering in on the word of God as it sustains us. I, I think what he's saying when he says you've lost your first love is you no longer are a church that should wear my name. You're no longer a church that should wear my name. You have lost your love for me. And if you don't repent of this, your light will go out. It's as if Jesus is saying, I know your enterprise and ministry. I know how you're engaging in culture. I know that you have a passion for families and students and teens. But I have this against you. I'm not the main thing in your life anymore. I don't hold supremacy in what you call yourself and how you act as a church. So how, how does this happen? How did it happen to the Ephesian church? How could it happen to us? I suspect what happened to the Ephesian church is what happens to many, many marriages. Life gets full and we start taking each other for granted. How do you keep your first love? How do you do that? Remember, he said, remember the height from which you have fallen. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Let me ask you a question. Was there a time when you loved Christ more than you love him now? Was there a time when you loved Christ more than you love yourself? Now, the way to measure this is not necessarily by reviewing your life's experience. The way to measure this is through Scripture, because the Bible defines, describes how it is when we love Christ with all of our hearts. Notice with me 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You talk about first love. You talk about the top of the ladder when it comes to our priorities. Or have you become comfortable with the shallowness of life. 
The second thing he tells them to do is repent. Remember that as he is talking to the Ephesian church, and as he goes through the list of great things they are doing, when it comes to the time that he says you have lost your first love, he isn't talking about church scandal. No, not at all. He's not, he's not talking about gross immorality that was found among the people. He says, repent, because your heart has grown cold for me. And if that happens, nothing else matters. I will have to come to Ephesus. And I'll have to take that lampstand that is my Holy Spirit from you and give it to somebody who resembles my church. Maybe you'll be moved to say, well, Jeff, I'm going to come to the Lord and I'm going to talk about the big sins in my life. I don't talk a lot about that, but I'm going to talk about the big stuff. I'm going to talk about the biggest sin in my life. Lord, my love for you is weak. In all the activities of my life and all that I'm doing, Lord, I am losing sight of you. And I'm so sorry. Now, at this point in the lesson, if the Holy Spirit is stirring you inside, I don't think it's because I'm stepping on your toes. I think that gives me way too much credit. If your heart is stirring inside as you reflect upon the question, was there a time in your life when you loved Christ more than you love him now? I want you to thank God for that. I want you to thank God that he has tenderized your heart to hear a message of repentance today. There's a quote and it says, the heart is hard only when it doesn't know it's hard. A man is hardened only when he doesn't know he's hardened. When we're concerned about our coldness, it's because of the yearning God has put there. If God puts that yearning in your heart today, thank him for it. Another key. Jesus says, you need to do the things you did at first. I'm thinking about that time in my life. You know the first thing that I did when I became a Christian? I told somebody about it. My, uh, my roommate uh, during that time, his name is Dwayne Bowden. Hi, Dwayne. He sometimes watches these. Um, he was the one who, who, who told me about the churches of Christ. He's the one that brought me to church where his uncle was, was preaching. It's the first time I had ever stepped inside of a church building or the, that church building for sure. Um, I, I remember, uh, uh, that when I became a Christian, I called Dwayne up because I was so excited. I wanted him to know what had happened in my life. I mean, it was the greatest thrill of my life. And I thought everybody would be excited. When I told my parents, they were very kind to me. And they, however, rolled their eyes. And I believe that they thought that uh, Jeff's going to get over this. I mean, they, they didn't mind me being a religious person. They didn't mind me uh, believing in Christ at, at all. But they never thought that it would have an impact on my life other than begrudgingly going to church on Sunday. Um, the first thing I did that resembled my early life in Christ is that I told somebody when I became a child of God. Um, then, I, then I had faith. I had faith in God. And, and what is that faith? What, what is it to have faith? Well, it, it's, it's kind of like getting into a limousine and you sit in the back 
and they've got uh, coke for you to drink, music is playing, the air conditioner is keeping you cool, and the chauffeur has directions to where you need to go. And it doesn't matter what the traffic is doing, it doesn't matter how slow you have to go, because you are absolutely placing your hand and your circumstance in the hands of somebody you believe in. I may not have even met him before, but I believe that he'll get me safely to where I intend to go. That kind of faith has a way of causing us to hold on to our first love. It is when we become fearful and afraid and every nuance of our lives is, is met with the, well, what if? Well, what if? The, the faith that allows us to keep Jesus number one in our life is, is the faith that extends trust and says, Lord, I know you'll take care of me. I'm not worried. Second, I think we need to open a heartfelt conversation with Christ. And that has to do with prayer. And there's so much I could say, but I don't have room in this brief lesson. But, but the communication that you have with Jesus allows you to grow more intimate with him. The more you talk to Jesus, the greater relationship you'll have with him. Does that make sense? Does that make what it's called? It's obvious. It's obvious to anybody. People come to me and they say, Jeff, I don't feel close to God. And I say, well, how often do you pray? And they say, I don't know. No, I said, no, really, I want you to answer me. How often do you pray? I don't know how often I pray. I, I don't know. <clears throat> you know, I pray three, four times a week, I pray. And I said, well, you want to get closer with God. And I'm telling you that you are as close to anybody as you would be speaking two or three times to them a week. If that is the limit of your communication with God, don't expect, don't expect intimacy. Don't expect real closeness. You might be an acquaintance. I think we need to draw toward our first love by taking an interest in what matters most to Christ. The person who never opens their heart does not love well. But the opposite is also true. The person who, ever, who only ever talks about himself doesn't love well either. What, what does it take for us to make sure that we embrace our first love and never lose it? Let me share something with you that I wonder if you ever considered, listen to me, family, listen to me. We as leadership in the church have tried all that we possibly know at this point to get you to come and worship regularly. The ministry offerings aren't doing it nor is the singing or our Bible classes, certainly not the preaching. So let me give you a whole other reason to come and join the church. And if you live in our region, in our area, come and join the Richland Church on Sundays. It's for communion, for the Lord's Supper. I mean, we just shared in communion from these little plastic cups and while it's not all that we used to have, I'm still moved by that experience. I still feel a closeness to you as we take of communion together over our phones or television sets. But I'm looking forward to having communion like we used to have it. And I'm, I'm saying to you, it's a good enough reason to come to church simply to honor God and his son, Jesus Christ, through the Lord's Supper. That's a good enough reason. And if nothing else gets you there, to commune with your brothers and sisters, the reality of the sacrifice of Jesus is reason enough. 
We come to the table and we take the bread and we take the cup and Christ is there. The risen Christ meets us at the table every time we join together. And I've got to tell you something. I'm becoming concerned about the way that churches in general affect or reflect the two great ordinances of Christ regarding being a Christian. The two most obvious rules, if you want to use that term, and I'm not ashamed to use it, about following Christ is this. Number one, it's baptism. And number two, it's the breaking of bread. We commemorate our death in baptism. We remember his death for us in communion. And the devil is actively involved in us neglecting both of them. Number one, we marginalize the one. Churches say, well, you know, baptism is simply a sign of a converted life. It's the outward sign of an inward change. It's it's a number of things. It's an application to church membership. It's something that we do, uh, you know, maybe quarterly, maybe not that often, maybe, you know, uh, every other time, at, uh, twice a year. And, and, and while that adopts a, a point of view that diminishes what baptism is, as this being buried in the blood of Christ. Every New Testament passage that talks about baptism places it squarely in the middle of that which we do not to reflect our salvation, but to be a part of our salvation. And the second thing that is diminished is the Lord's Supper. Again, it's kind of a religious ceremony. Uh, it, it, it's something that is done uh, out of convenience and in the most convenient kind of way, which means rarely. We, it's real convenient. It's so convenient for us that we don't hardly do it at all. And yet you, you misunderstand. You misunderstand the two great ordinances of Christ. Number one, be baptized. Number two, Remember me. Remember me. And I've given you a way to do that. The first church made it a high priority in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 46. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. So this congregation retains its first love when its membership does the same. So in review very quickly, how to make sure that we never lose our first love is we exercise our faith. We step out in faith, and I think we can do it today. Number two, we repent of our distracted heart and bring our heart under control, reining it in to focus on Christ. Number three, we take an interest in what matters most to Christ. The areas of individual ministry expand. And finally, we commune with Jesus by the partaking of the Lord's Supper, drinking the cup, sharing in the blood and eating the bread and sharing in the body is a great and marvelous biblical way for you to make sure you keep Christ at the center of your life. Our lesson's been in Revelation chapter 2 about the Ephesian church being told to repent because they had lost their first love. Let me leave you with this. My mother was my first love. My father is my God. My brother is my hero. My sister is my best friend. 
My spouse is my beloved partner, but Jesus is my only Savior. Oh